Hello and welcome to Furious Driving. Now, if you're in the market for some car, and three meters of car wasn't quite enough car, and five meters of car was just a silly amount of car, I can heartily recommend buying 4.6 meters of car, because that's just the right amount for some people and some stuff to go to some places. In comfort, yes, we are bordering dangerously into the realms of sensible buying advice with this, a 2001 Toyota Avensis Estate, and it's a two litre CDX manual, no less. Right, let's get on with this. And if you like reviews of different unusual cars, then please do hit like and subscribe. Now, on with the review. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the Furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. Now this car is something of a unicorn because as I'm sure you know, the Avensis was very much a fleet car favorite. A car often bought more for its running costs and dependability rather than any sense of desire or style. So more often than not, they were specced fairly low to mid range in a utilitarian kind of a manner. So finding a CDX which is absolutely loaded with every extra the thing could possibly have, apart from whatever went on that button just there, is really quite impressive. So the Avensis was launched in 1997. Avensis is a bit of a play on words. It's based off the French word avanceur, pardon my pronunciation, which effectively means stepping ahead or moving on because it was moving on from the Carina E which had been a bit of a game changer for a Toyota and also a landmark because the Carina had been the first car built in the UK at their Berniston factory in Derbyshire. So although this is a Japanese car we are today testing another British car. Who knew? So the way the events has been styled is actually very interesting in so much as it's not very interesting. As much as it doesn't entice anyone, it doesn't offend either, so it kind of works for everybody, in a way. In 2000, Toyota gave it a facelift, so a subtle difference to the front, different headlights, different grille, that kind of thing. But of course, being an Avensis, apart from the basest of base models, they're all fairly well equipped, so seeing fog lights isn't that unusual on these. So this was really a car for the fleet market at heart, but there were plenty of private buyers who bought them as well but it was up against some incredibly stiff opposition in what was, at the time, an enormously crowded marketplace for saloons, hatchback and estate mid to large family sized cars. You had the obvious Mondeo and Vectra, but then of course you had the Passat, the Accord, the Alpha 156, the Laguna, the 406. There were more, I'm sure, but there's just so many of them at the time before the SUV explosion. If you had a family, this is the kind of thing you bought. This car apparently went to a little old lady who barely used it. The fact it's 20 years old, it's got 55,000 miles a clock on the clock, attests to that. And it is in really rather good condition. It looks barely worn at all, apart from a few sort of bumper scuffs and wheel scuffs, which is absolutely incredible. But because of the kind of market it was aimed at, it wasn't intended to be as dynamically excellent as a Mondeo or as visually exciting as an Alpha. The strengths it played to instead were Toyota's legendary reliability and the fact you could have one of these for not a massive amount of money, have a ton of kit in it, and it would basically never go wrong. And I'm fairly certain that Toyota Care sticker over there has seen very little call to action. So fleet managers loved them. People who didn't really care much about what they drove, they just wanted it to get there and never go wrong and be comfortable. They bought them. So they did sell a lot of these things. And they were very well spec. You had to go to the absolute base model, the S, in order to lose stuff like electric mirrors and air conditioning. Everything else had increments of really good spec. Okay, so here we are looking at the interior of this machine, which is, inoffensive in a bland yet pleasant kind of way. It's very well thought out, very comfortable. Nothing stands out in a way that suggests it's bad or extremely good either. I am gonna crack open a window because it is extremely warm. This car is a CDX, which means it's absolutely loaded with everything that you could have on this car 
And it's a pretty unusual spec for one of these because generally these were fleet cars or bought to a cost. Very few of them were specced to the nines as this was. So this has got leather, which means leather inserts in the door, the soft touch plastics, everywhere else, I say soft, it's hardish, but not too hard. Plastic door handles, as in the rest of the range, the large rollover door locks, as we find in all Japanese cars of the era. Four electric windows, no less. Auto one touch on the driver's window. Rear window lockout and central locking on that little bar there. You'll notice this is in a wood, well, woodish insert. Very, very fancy indeed. Large speaker down there, no tweeter up there, you will notice, and a big door pocket down here. So very, very practical and becomes very comfortable and kind of stylish with this. Kind of aping the Alfa Romeo diagonal double stitch slashes in this, in this door card as well. Moving on to the dashboard again, because CDX, we've got more of the fake wood, and I have to say it is the fakest of fake woods you will ever see. Some fake woods, they do leave you thinking, had it ever seen a tree or not, you're not quite sure. This leaves you in no such dilemma. This is 100% oil-based timber. Um, this does have a little vent going off to the window, a movable vent, obviously a control for the vent, a square panel for moving your electric mirrors, something that incredibly on the CDX isn't here, and dipping for your headlights. Underneath that, we have got a wee pistol pocket coin tub, tiny hidey hole down there. And in the center, we've got more fake wood. Again, CDX, but something missing. What could it be? Heated rear window and hazard lights. It's exactly the same vent and controls as the side. Interesting, some cars do have a different style of side vent to the center. This one, nothing changed there. However, you'll be excited to see the far left one is grey to match the surrounding dashboard because there's no timber surround. I do wonder if there was never a timber insert on the left or if that's broken at some point and someone's just changed it with whatever they could find. Anyway, back to the, the central wood area. This car has got air conditioning, which was standard incredibly. The Avensis, Avensi eye were very well specced. You really had to go to the absolute bottom, the S model, which is not even an SE, it's just the S, in order to lose a lot of the luxuries that came on these cars as standard. So air conditioning, which I can tell you is astonishingly powerful, and I'm very grateful for it today. A double din area, which has meant someone has been able to upgrade to a Sony double din with CD, and cassette and i'm sure i'm about to have a thousand comments where people telling me actually no toyota used a sony double in with uh, cd player and cassette as standard i very much doubt that though the fact it is a doubled in space has made this so much easier that someone could do this this is a sony change your control audio master wx c570 if anyone's interested and i'm actually kind of fascinated i think it should be a whole subgenre of video purely about old car radios this has got D-Base, which you can control on this actual dial. Volume on a, on a separate dial. Mode, cassette, AM, FM, mini disc control, CD control. Oh my word. This, this suits this car so perfectly. This is the most 2001 uh, head unit upgrade I've ever seen. I absolutely love it. Underneath that, fag lighter, huge ashtray and a big cubby hole. This car is intensely practical. Moving up to the top of that, I did skirt over it. There is the best T-shelf you've seen in a long while. Big T-shelf area there, large T-shelf area there, although there is the passenger airbag, so be careful if you're using it as a mobile T-shelf because you could wind up wearing your confectionery. Much, much, much ventilation up by the windscreen to keep you clear with the addition of the air conditioning. That's gonna be fantastic. The dials are very big, very clear, very obvious. Speedometer are going to 160, that's optimistic. Rev counter redlining at just over 6,000 RPM, which is pretty decent. Then we've got a big fuel, big heater, and LCD panels explaining things as we go along. What will it tell us? It tells us our mileage is 55,000 on this car, which is remarkably low for a car of this age. Um, the temperature outside, it's 28 degrees, and I am feeling every single one of them, I have to say. Moving back, we've got our stalks, headlights, indicators, fog lights on the left-hand stalk. Wipers, front and rear, 
on the right. There's a third stalk for the Sony, which I think has been stuck on aftermarket. The slightly shiny plastic feel does look very much at home in the Toyota though. You could be forgiven for thinking this is a factory option. Finally, the steering wheel. This is a nice leather steering wheel actually, surprisingly. Got a big airbag in it. It's a four spoke item and the horn is here as well, horn test. Ooh, that's a high pitched pop. Something of a falsetto pop for such a large car. I'm a little bit surprised at that. Anyway, swinging back around to the rest of the cabin, got gray leather seats, which are actually very, very thin backed. Interesting how they've managed to make quite a comfortable and supportive seat. So very, very narrow to take up so little space within the car. And when I say narrow from front to back, not left to right, it is a kind of a pale, inoffensive gray gray, one of the grayest grays you're gonna come across. It matches the gray of the door, the gray of the carpet, the gray of the dashboard, even the gray of the headlining. This is a very, very gray space. Nothing apart from the very pretend wood leaps out at you to say, my word, that's exciting, that's interesting. Or wake up. <laughs> it takes average to a whole new level. If average could be exceptional, this is exceptionally average in every way. It's good in a not exceptional way, but it's not bad either. Okay, moving back to the center, we have got a five-speed manual gearbox with a leather gear knob again, because it, it is the CDX, so it is all the toys, so leather seats, leather gear knob, leather steering wheel. Then we've got this enormous handbrake, which comes up forever, which is the biggest thing in the world. Um, to the left of that, we've got a twin cup holder, good size, then held latch shut with a little nubby thing there a small armrest cubby hole, which has got CD storage in there. Currently holding my car keys. That's not leather topped, it looks leather topped, but it's actually hard plastic. Above us, we have got a sunroof. It is an electric sunroof. I've said before, I'm terrified to use sunroofs on test drives because that's always a thing that will break. However, this is a Toyota, so I have no qualms about pulling that open because I just know it will be fine. Now in the back of the car, we have got a lot of space. This is really, really comfortable. Really nice. We've got a ton of tow room and acres of knee room. Um, and because it's an estate, the back of the car goes on a long way behind me. So the headroom doesn't vanish either. So this is incredibly comfortable. If you're looking for a family car that is ideal for sort of growing teenagers sitting in the back, you really couldn't go wrong with this at all. You've got more of the, the leather, which is really rather nice. It feels hard wearing, but it's also quite soft touch as well. So many good things going on there. We have got an armrest in the center to keep squabbling teens apart. This has got a center armrest with storage and cup holders. So more good stuff just there. We've got a little ashtray in the back there. We've got storage in the back of the seats speakers in the doors but no door storage electric windows because cdx and grab handles and this is so you can roll your luggage guard forward if you've got the seats folded and hook your dog guard in there I think of everything i really do yeah this is a really nice place to be you can see why so many of these wound up being mini cabs also we've got three interior lights front interior light middle one has come on with the rear door and there's one in the boot as well so again a ton of good stuff. Now moving around to the business end of the estate car, you can see it is the CDX, but they've also not gone crazy with the fripperies. Bit of wraparound black plastic trim, heading back from the wheel arch, body color bumpers, but only a black plastic button to open the boot. Does however have a little pull, which is a bonus. The boot area is huge initially. It's really wide, really low lip, all very good stuff. It does get very narrow, or a lot narrower I should say, when we get into the wheel well, surprisingly unpractical for such a massively practical car. It is a very tall, wide opening though, so there's a lot of practicality. We have got our load space cover, and I believe, and I believe there's also a net option as well for that as well. Under the floor, oh that's heavy, full size alloy spare wheel. They have given us absolutely everything, and over to the side we've got little cubby holes hiding the jack and a toolkit. An interesting side feature here is to remove the load space cover, you have these enormous handles. It's like train signals, if you wanna go and pull those things, ko chung kung going to the factory to take this thing out. Most cars do a little button on the top, not this great big walloping handle. 
to flip the seats forward and it's a 60-40 split, little button on top. So that's a much bigger item with a tiny winnie button compared to this small item, huge handle. Makes no sense. Now under the skin, it's got McPherson struts at the front. It's got double wishbones at the back, anti-roll bars front and rear, disc brakes all round, obviously vented at the front. And so it's a pretty comfortable car to drive. It doesn't have that kind of sparkling pizzazz that a Mondeo or a 156 will have, but it doesn't feel bad either. There is enough weight to all of the controls to give you a little bit of feedback and give you something, but at the same time, everything is just slick enough that it feels like it could be like the simulator version of a real car. There's not quite enough feedback. Now, the gear shift has got a little bit of resistance through it, but not too much. And the steering is a little bit weighty, but not too much. And the pedals are all just nicely weighted, a little bit of resistance, a little bit of weight, but again, just a nice amount. Although it's all the spiritual and physical continuation of the Carinery, the only real major parts that carried over from that car were the engines. Initially, it came with a 1.6, 1.8, and two liter engines in petrol, and a two litre turbo diesel. Now this is the cream of the petrol crop with that two litre motor. Although it's a big engine, it's not massively powerful, which is something of a running theme with Japanese petrols, it seems. This one has 126 horsepower and 178 newton meters of torque, and it gives it a top speed of 127, eight miles an hour, and a nought to 60 of around 10 to 11 seconds. And the payoff for all that performance is a combined MPG of about 34. So it's fairly average all round, like everything else. The sitting position is pretty good. The layout of the controls is pretty good. Everything is well, pretty good actually, yeah. It's hard to find anything to actually fault on the car, but at the same time, it's hard to really go, wow, that's outstandingly good either. This is possibly the best very average car I've ever driven. The ride is very comfortable. It's not exciting, but it is very comfortable. Although one thing is very much above average is the air conditioning. It's auto climate control apparently, but whack this on full and it's like visiting the Arctic for a few minutes. It's incredible how powerful this is for a 20 year old system. Remember, I've got two 20 year old cars, Mini and an Alpha, neither of their air cons work. Now, interestingly, the Avensis wasn't a world car, as so many of its rivals would have been. It was a Europe-only model, sold as a four-door saloon, a five-door hatchback, or liftback, as Toyota prefer to call it, and this, the estate car. The only exceptions to that were that it was sold in South America as the Corona, and the estate car body was shared with a model called the Caldina, which is a Japanese domestic market-only model. Who knew? But all the European cars were built here in the UK up in Derbyshire, which is nice. And the Mark I Avensis ran from 1997 until 2003, when it was replaced with, wait for it, the Mark II. And that was replaced with the Mark III. Now you may not be excited by this car, but there is a demand for cars that are capable but unexciting. Just look at how many dull crossovers there are on the market now, which I'm sure are completely capable but are just completely unexciting as well. This at least has the advantage that an unexciting saloon or estate or hatch can at least be dynamically good without chucking a load of computers at it. I would wager this is far more fun to drive as a dull estate car than any dull crossover is. So yes, the Toyota Revensis. It may not be everyone's cup of tea, but no one's gonna say no to a cup of tea of any kind, ultimately. It might be too milky, it might be too strong, but still, a cup of tea is a cup of tea. Can't go wrong, really. And that's exactly what the Advensis is. It's a decent car for pretty much any situation. You can't go wrong. In this particular case, a 20-year-old, 50,000-mile, two-litre manual estate. What can you say? It's, what, a grand and a half's worth of car here? And it is fantastic. This is a lot of car, and it's a Toyota, so everything works. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this look around this car, then please do hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.